Hi, friends. I think some of you are still joining. So I'm going to give this a minute. I started this a minute early so um, everyone could join us. Um, go ahead and leave a comment in the chat to tell me you're here and where you're from. I love to see where everyone is from. And um, I'm really excited for you all to be here. So thank you so much for joining us and seeing a bunch of people logging in right now. Hello, so I'm just, please let me know where you're from. I just have to say, I'm so nervous about the technology working. So I'm so glad to see people are joining and everything worked without any issues. So thank you so much for any all your patience and any technical issues that you had logging in. I'm so glad that you were able to join from all over the country. This is amazing, so exciting. Okay, guys, so many of you know me. My name is Jenny Levine Fink. I am the blogger at Good For You Gluten Free. A lot of you might follow my blog. Some of you might know me from Instagram and on my newsletter. Some of you are joining us from Crunchmaster. Thank you so much for sending out that invite, Crunchmaster, and welcome, Crunchmaster friends. Um, today, we're going to talk about ways that you might be sabotaging your gluten-free diet and some things you can do about that to really get the most out of your gluten-free diet. I think a lot of us are eating gluten-free and it's a difficult lifestyle and we want to make sure we're getting the most out of it, right? So we're going to be talking about that a little bit today and I just want to allow some people to join and, and get in here. Um, I also wanted to tell you a little story to start out is that I think a lot of you might know that I published a book a few weeks ago called Dear Gluten, It's Not Me, It's You. And what's really cool about this is that, okay, I did it during COVID. It's kind of a crazy thing. And I wasn't able to travel to all these expos and bakeries and meet everyone like I had hoped when I launched my book. And so I decided I'm going to bring bring this to you, bring it to your living room here in the COVID era and bring my little book tour to you. So I'm really glad that you're here and joining me. And when I ran this idea by Crunchmaster, they've been partners of mine for a while, they were totally on board and they've made this whole process free for everyone. So it's really been a beautiful thing for all of us. So I want to share my screen and get right into this presentation that I wanna share with you. Oh, I love seeing everyone. Oh, we have someone here from Slovakia. Wow, amazing. Um, this will be recorded and you will have a chance for questions. So go ahead and leave your questions. I'm not gonna be able to see your comments and questions once I screen share, but I'm gonna come back to them at the end. I'm leaving plenty of time for questions. Okay, so let me share my screen. Let's see, desktop. Okay, oh, you guys are probably seeing my Zoom here. So I'm gonna um, put this up. Okay, hopefully you guys can all see my screen right now. And you can see the title is Quit Sabotaging Your Gluten-Free Diet. And I forgot to mention that in addition to my blog and my book, I'm also a certified integrative nutrition coach. I'm certified by the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And so um, I am gonna, share some of my expertise with you and some of my personal experiences with you today. Oh, let's see, there we go. Okay, so this is what we're gonna talk about today. Here's our agenda. We're gonna talk about four ways you might be sabotaging your gluten-free diet, four ways you can get the most out of eating gluten-free. I've got a free gift for everyone. I've got some fun giveaways. And like I said, we have plenty of time for q and I can't see, well, I think I can see your Q&A, but I'm not gonna look at the questions that you guys are submitting. You should be able to submit questions in the Q&A box. Um, so if you have questions, please go ahead and write them there or save them to the end. We're going to have plenty of time for questions and I hope that I can provide some good answers and um, resources for you during the Q&A session. So before we begin, I have to tell you this, I'm not a doctor. So if you're going to make any changes to your diet or you have any unique health challenges, please discuss them with your doctor. One of the things that I truly believe is that I may not have all the answers for you today, and you may not have all the answers yourself, but it's more important to be asking the right questions, right? So I'm hoping that you're going to kind of drum up some more questions to ask if you're having any sort of health challenges or if you want to get more out of your gluten-free diet. 
I'm here to help you get the most out of it and ask the right questions, right? It's not always having the answers, it's having the right questions. So take those questions, write them down on a piece of paper and go discuss it with your doctor, preferably a doctor who has a background in functional medicine um, or a, nu a nutrition professional who comes from an integrative or functional nutrition background. That's someone who's gonna really look at your diet and, um, and understand how food can maybe help or hurt you. And it's not um, always just about pills and stuff like that. It's, it's kind of about diet and pills and someone who can really help you in that holistic approach to your health. I also want you to take things at your own pace. We might talk about some things like, oh, I wanna do that, I wanna do that, I wanna do that, but do things at your own pace and um, experiment on yourself. There's no one way to do things. I always like to say there's, you know, no one's heels in a straight line, right? So do this at your own pace, at your own time, and um, be kind to yourself. My mom always says, when you know better, you can do better, right? So as you go along and you learn new things, you can do better. And um, just be kind to yourself throughout this process, because this gluten-free diet is serious business, and it's a lot of work. And I just want to take a moment to thank Crunchmaster. Um, like I mentioned before, for those of you who were able to be on at the very beginning of our chat, that Crunchmaster is sponsoring this webinar. It's a webinar series. I'm going to do three of these. I've got one in January. I've got one in February. You guys are going to get a vote for which ones you want to see um, me do. Um, at the end of this webinar. And um, I really couldn't have done this without Crunchmaster. So thank you, Crunchmaster. And I've got a bag right here. And I was just looking at their um, grain-free ones. And I just have to say, I think there's like six ingredients in this. It's so clean and, and really wonderful. And I love making snack boards and I love my dips and all those things. So I hope you guys um, you know, enjoy Crunchmaster, no Crunchmaster. They're huge supporters of the celiac disease community. And it's just a really great brand for you to keep in your pantry and, and help you snack on those healthy dips and, and fun snack boards that we're all loving putting together here during COVID. Oops. Okay, so now let's get into these sabotages that I've been teasing you about. <laughs> all right, so the first sabotage that you might be doing to your gluten-free diet is that you're still eating gluten. And I know you're like, oh, Jenny, come on, I know this. I know I'm supposed to eat gluten-free. Like, this is so obvious. But the truth is we all know people or maybe have been this person who has said this, a little bite won't hurt me. And that is not true regardless if you have celiac or if you have a gluten sensitivity because a little bite will hurt you. And <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little story. I'll, I'll never forget several years ago when we used to eat inside restaurants, you guys might remember that. Um, but when we were eating in a restaurant, I was with a bunch of girlfriends and some of us were gluten-free and some of us were not. And um, one of my gluten-free girlfriends said, oh my gosh, my, you know, one of the other girls dishes look so good. And she took her fork and she put it in her dish and she took a bite. And I was like, no, no, that's not gluten-free. And she's like, oh, well, it's not like I have celiac. And, um, she's like a little bit is okay for me. Like it doesn't bother me. I don't have celiac like you, Jenny. And I was like, wait, 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 you know, you can't make a big fuss about being gluten-free and then not really be gluten-free or to say, you know, I'm taking a week off cause I'm going on vacation or it's my birthday. I'm going to just eat this birthday cake this once. There, there really is no vacation from being gluten-free. A little bite can hurt you. And so if you are still sneaking a little bite here and there, or you're not being careful about what you're eating, you're still eating gluten and you're still harming your body. And in people with celiac disease, you are setting off a whole autoimmune reaction in your body and you're, you know, totally, uh, ruining your chances of healing, you're depleting your nutrient bank, all this kind of stuff. If you have a gluten sensitivity, you're totally inflamed. Your intestines are totally inflamed and your small intestines um, are so crucial to uh, your digestive system and to absorbing and distributing nutrients to your whole body from the food you eat. And so if it's completely inflamed, it's just not working. So a little bite can hurt you and will hinder you from healing, which we're going to talk a lot about. Another way you might still be eating gluten is through cross-contamination. And I know a lot of you have shared households and it's a challenge for you to eat 100% gluten-free or to avoid cross-contamination. Um, 
it's really important that you do and that the people in your family are really respectful of that and really try to keep any gluten in your house separate from your gluten-free foods. But really, it happens mostly in a restaurant. And I know I'm not eating in restaurants much anymore, especially with COVID, I'm home much more. But um, like I went to a brunch restaurant and I ordered an omelet. And instead of getting the toast, I always ask for a bowl of fruit instead. And she's like, oh, the waiter said, no, 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 we have, we have gluten-free bread. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll do the gluten-free bread. And she brought it out and it was toasted. And in my brain, I'm like, wait a second this is gluten-free bread, but how did you toast it? I mean, it's so highly unlikely that any restaurant's gonna have a gluten-free dedicated toaster. And sure enough, it was just toasted in the, the you know big commercial toasters that they're using to toast all the bread in the restaurant, gluten-free or not. And a lot can get messed up in there. Gluten bits are everywhere. And so let's just say that toast is no longer gluten-free and cross-contamination is real. And you guys really have to be careful about that. Um, we know a lot about the shared fryer and how French fries cooked in the same oil with breaded nuggets are no longer gluten-free, right? Because that breading is getting on your French fries. And the same with pasta, um, waffles. A lot of restaurants offer gluten-free waffles, but what are they cooking that gluten-free waffle batter in? Do they really have a dedicated gluten-free waffle iron? And anyone who has a waffle iron, you know that thing does not clean easily. So you are likely still eating gluten and this is sabotaging your gluten-free diet. And then another way you might be sabotaging your gluten-free diet is if you're just not being careful and you're not reading labels and you're just eating things because mm, I have a feeling this is gluten-free. <laughs> and that's so not true. Uh, one of my biggest stories is this red vines. I'll never forget that I, a friend got me these red vines and they look gluten-free, don't they? Who would have thunk it that these would contain gluten? But I, as soon as I turned over that container and I saw the first ingredient was wheat flour, I was like, holy cow, I had no idea my whole life I've been eating so much gluten because I used to love red vines. And um, you'll notice it's in hidden in products like Rice Krispies. And obviously you guys hear about these things like dressings and things like that, that contain gluten. So you can't just go off it looking gluten-free. Hey, it, it doesn't look like bread. It doesn't look like pizza. It must be gluten-free. It's not true. It's hiding in so many different places. Okay, and then my next way that I believe many of us are sabotaging our gluten-free diet is that we have not changed our eating habits. And so this picture of this woman eating donuts, I wish I wish I had a picture of me doing that because um, I did not change my diet habits several years into the gluten-free diet. Um, I had celiac, I was completely asleep at the wheel. I had no idea about food and nutrition um, in the aftermath of my celiac diagnosis. And it took me a long time to really wake up and to say, hey, wait a second. I don't think gluten-free donuts are gonna heal my body. And I, I felt better after going gluten-free. I think a lot of us do. Um, but then I sort of relapsed and I got worse, but I was eating strictly gluten-free. And I think all of us know if you're eating gluten-free, like this is a lot of work and you want to get the most out of this diet. But if your eating habits haven't changed and you're still just swapping unhealthy gluten for unhealthy gluten-free products, you're really not doing yourself any favor. Sure, you got the gluten out and the gluten is damaging to your body but you are potentially injuring your body in other ways, or you're definitely not promoting health in your life. For those of you just joining us right now, if you have any questions, please go ahead and leave them in the comments box. I can't see your comments right now because I'm screen sharing, um, but I will look at all your comments and questions and we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So thank you guys so much for joining them. I'm so excited to see all of you here. Um, we had almost 500 people register today. So it really made me so excited. And I know a lot of people are gonna watch this even later today when they're on their lunch break, if they're not on their break right now. So um, anyway, as I was saying that one of the ways we're sabotaging our bodies um, and our diets, our health and our diets, I should say, is that we're still overindulging on things like junk food and sweets and fast food and hard to digest foods, you know, foods that really aren't, 
doing our digestive system any favors. Um, we might be overindulging on things like meats and cheeses that are harder to digest. And you'll know, I never tell people, oh, don't eat this food group, don't eat that food group. This is about you experimenting with yourself, what works, but knowing that certain food groups are just hard to digest foods. Um, chemical foods, foods that have a lot of chemicals in them or are highly processed, those can do a lot of damage to your body too and really slow down your healing. And just remember, because something's gluten-free, doesn't mean it's good for you. And I always joke, sugar's gluten-free. Whenever tell, people tell me, oh, you must be so healthy, you eat gluten-free. I'm like, sugar's gluten-free. So <laughs> just something to keep in mind. All right, the next way so many of us are sabotaging our gluten-free diets and our health is that we haven't addressed our gut issues. And I just wanna say one more time, talk to your doctor if you have persistent gut issues or health concerns, because gut issues are so important to address. And I think a lot of us have been diagnosed with gluten, a gluten disorder, and our doctors tell us, don't eat gluten anymore, but they don't really address the wounds left behind. I always think about it, like let's say you're stabbed with a knife in your gut, <laughs> and that, that knife's gonna hurt, it's gonna destroy your gut and then you just pull the knife out, are you healed? No, there is so much damage left behind, right? So if you think of gluten as that knife that goes in your gut, um, if you just pull the knife, the gluten, if you just pull the gluten out, it doesn't mean you have addressed the wounds left behind. There's so much damage to your gut. And so that's really where I think a lot of modern medicine might be missing a little bit. And you're gonna see a lot of doctors today are really starting to, understand gut health and the importance of gut health and how everything we eat goes into our bodies and affects every cell and organ in our body. And we're seeing a lot of doctors really wake up to this. It's such an exciting time to be in nutrition where we're starting to see people think about um, whole body health and root causes and things like that. So I, I applaud many of the doctors out there that are really helping people with celiac disease understand their gut health. Um, this is an image that I thought really helped me. This is an image of what intestinal permeability or uh, leaky gut, a lot of us call it leaky gut, looks like. And so um, I think you can see my pointer here. So this is, these are cells that line your intestinal wall. This is your intestine here, intestinal wall. So these are cells that are going to align the, the test intestinal wall. And you can see they have these tight, healthy juncture, junctions between them. So the cells are nice and lined up beautifully and nothing's getting through these babies, right? And you can also see on the top are these hair-like uh, hair -like microvilli is what they're called. And these are aiding in the absorption and distribution of nutrients and they should be long and finger-like and flowy. In people with celiac disease, these are flattened or really stubby. So um, I don't have a picture of that to show you, but when you are experiencing leaky gut and inflammation of the gut, you're gonna see that these tight junctions between the cells are broken. And so particles of food that may not have been properly digested, you know, maybe you're eating hard to digest foods or foods that aren't working for you or gluten, which we know is, is a huge trigger, um, they're then, not getting fully digested by your stomach acid and all the other digestive systems that lead into your small intestine. And then they're busting out of your gut into your bloodstream here. And they're wreaking havoc throughout your body. You don't want these foreign things in your blood. It's setting off all sorts of immune system responses. Like, let's go fight. What is this guy? We got to go fight these, you know, toxins that are making their way into your blood. And um, one of my favorite authors and also doctors, he's the leading doctor of gluten sensitivity, is Dr. Tom O'Brien. And he wrote a fantastic book called The Autoimmune Fix. And in his book, he talks a lot about how when these, these little food particles leak from your gut into your bloodstream, they're not always causing issues in your digestive system. They're wreaking havoc throughout your whole body at, where, at the point where you are most genetically vulnerable or weak. And so this is why we're seeing a lot of people um, diagnosed with leaky gut. This is why we're seeing a lot of people with celiac disease not being diagnosed through classical symptoms, which would be gut issues, and they're being diagnosed through joint pain or skin disorder 
or other other stations of this these, this leaky gut that they're experiencing. So just really fascinating. I love Dr. Tom. He actually wrote the foreword to my book too. So huge fan. If you are experiencing symptoms despite eating gluten-free like gut issues or just the issues that you were experiencing prior to going on the gluten-free diet, just talk to your doctors about ways that you can heal and seal your gut. And I'm going to give you some pointers in a bit, but it is important for you to come up with a plan for yourself and your own body. And remember, symptoms can present themselves in different ways, not just gas and bloating. Like that's what I had. I had like really painful bloating and, and icky gas. And it was just not pleasant to be me. Um, even after celiac disease, even after two years of eating gluten-free, I still did not feel fully recovered. And I felt like I almost relapsed. And so you might also notice some of these symptoms, um, uh, celiac and even a gluten sensitivity can impact so many different functions in your body. And so they're not just digestive symptoms. Okay. So the the fourth way, the fourth and final way that I'm going to talk about today, there's so many other ways, but the fourth way that so many of us are sabotaging our gluten-free diets is that we're giving up early. And it's so frustrating when people give up on it because it really can work if you give it a chance, right? So here's, I'm going to break it down in celiac and then gluten sensitive because it's kind of a different thought process about giving it enough time. So when people but with celiac, um, this is really an interesting stat that the mean age of a celiac diagnosis is 45 years old. So people are being diagnosed um, a little bit later in life. And this is really fascinating that there's a 12 year delay from your first symptom to diagnosis. That's the average. So you might have your first gassy bloating episode or joint pain or whatever it is. And then there's a 12 year delay before you actually figure out that it's celiac disease. And that's really frustrating. Um, and if you think about that, maybe you've had these symptoms for 12 years, by switching to a gluten-free diet, you may not feel better instantly because that's 12 years or more of damage to your body. And your, your body is pretty amazing. Like it's programmed to heal. You know, we cut our finger, get a big paper cut, how hurts, bleeds a little. Within a day or two, you don't even see that cut. Like the body really is programmed to heal. And so are our guts. The, the gut lining is similar to like our skin. It heals, it restores itself. But when that damage is just so persistent, it's gonna take some time. It's a bigger gaping wound in a way. Um, this was a fascinating stat to me, this third here, this third thing here. So this was a study and um, the researchers concluded that mucosal recovery, so this, the mucosal is the lining of your small intestine that we've been talking about, this really vital organ to nutrition in your body. <laughs> the mucosal recovery was absent in a substantial portion of adults with celiac disease after treatment with a gluten-free diet. And so they said after two years, they found that 34% of celiac, people with celiac have mucosal recovery and 66% after five years. And so think about it. You have to give this time if you wanna recover, first of all. Second of all, that's a long time to suffer. So that's a, you know, the gluten-free diet is your only treatment option, but to have to still deal with that recovery process for five years made me wonder, is there more than just eating gluten-free that is gonna help my body heal? You know, it's just swapping that gluten-free donut instead of that wheat donut. Is that really healing my, my lining of my small intestine? So, you know, give it time, but also think maybe I need to start asking questions like, is there more? than gluten-free that I need to be doing in order to really accelerate this healing process. Cause I don't know about you, but I don't want to feel sick for five years waiting for my gut to heal. I want to, I want to figure that I figured it out. I want to, I want to accelerate that process. And then if you are gluten sensitive, a lot of people have been suffering for a long time before they've actually removed gluten or thought to remove gluten. Gluten sensitivity is super serious, actually. Um, one of the issues with gluten sensitivity is that um, it's only been a known diagnosis, I guess, or disorder for maybe 10 years now. So it's really new. A bunch of researchers had um, 
you know, found that people didn't have the genes for celiac and they didn't have the, the, manif or the presentation of celiac in their gut the way that the, the microvilli should look. It wasn't uh, in line with what someone with celiac disease has. And so they, they coined it non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And so it's a real disorder, just has, doesn't have a lot of research behind it yet. It's so new. And so something that you need to keep in mind is just because there's not a lot of research and just because it's a newer disorder doesn't mean it's not real and shouldn't be taken as serious as something like celiac, right? It's a serious, serious disorder. One thing I'm finding that a lot of people with gluten sensitivity is they go gluten-free before they rule out celiac, like they don't get tested for celiac. And so we have a lot of people who are gluten sensitive who may also have celiac, they have no idea, they never were tested properly. Um, and one of the issues with that is that we know people who have celiac are more compliant they're less likely to be the ones like, I'll just have a bite, it won't hurt me, or stick in their fork in someone else's meal, or they're gonna be so much more compliant with the gluten-free diet. And um, so if you, if you have a gluten sensitivity, you might have celiac, you don't know, you might not be completely compliant, so you're not really giving it that fair shake that it deserves. And that might be why you're not feeling better. It's not that the gluten-free diet isn't working, it's that you haven't given it enough time, and you haven't given it a fair, serious shake, right? That's my point. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about some fun solutions. And then we're going to also, after this, get to some fun giveaways as well. So I love having you all here. Thank you so much for joining me today for this learning webinar. It's a chance for me to get to know you all and get to see everyone. Well, sort of see you, right? <laughs> Through Zoom. All right, so some of the solutions is really auditing your life for hidden gluten. It's so important to make sure you are getting the gluten out, that you're not accidentally eating gluten. You know, really take this diet serious, really give it a fair shake, make sure there's no gluten in your medications, in any of the beauty products that come in around your face and even on your hands. And I'm just like, I just don't want it in any of my products, to be honest. Um, it cannot be absorbed through the skin um, unless you have an allergy. Obviously, if you have an allergy to wheat, um, you will have a reaction. But if you have celiac disease, you know, gluten, as far as we know, cannot be absorbed through the skin. I don't know if that research is going to change ever someday, but right now that's what we know. You know, look for certified gluten free on products. Um, obviously, I try to work and uh, share products that are certified gluten free. That's why I love Crunch Master certified gluten free. You know, companies that have gone that extra mile to get that third party verification are products that you can trust. And so those are just some of the seals that you can look for. And I want, I put this slide in because um, I have a really great presentation about how to decode for hidden gluten in your products and in, in food products and how to really get it out and what to look for and weird ingredients that might contain gluten. And so um, if that is a session you would like me to do in this three-part webinar series, be sure to vote for that at the end when I hopefully can figure out how to put up my poll at the end. But I would love to do a whole uh, talk with you about really decoding products for hidden gluten. It is in so many products, like it's crazy and you just need to be able to know where, where it is so you don't accidentally eat it. Um, another solution is really eating at home more because when we eat at home, we not only control if there's gluten in our food, of course, we don't put gluten in our food. We can read labels way more carefully, but when we eat at home, we're also controlling the sugar, um, the processed foods, we're controlling um, what we're putting on our plate. And one of the things that I always talk to my clients about and, and as part of my nutrition training is like, this is not rocket science. Half your plate should be fruits and veggies, preferably veggies and greens. Um, if you put half your plate vegetables and then you put a little bit of a lean meat and some good whole grains or something like that, you are in really good shape because you are gonna be eating all of those good foods. So eat at home more often and load up your plate with those good for you foods. And, and when you eat at home, you just know what you're putting in your food. It's, it's an easy solution to feeling well. Um, it's sort of the silver lining to COVID right now. Most of us are at home. I know here in Denver where I am, I think we're on stay at home orders, a level red, 
I'm not sure exactly what that means, but that means pretty much all the restaurants are closed and it's home. We're eating at home and occasionally you do takeout. And of course you have to be so careful with takeout because you can't have that face-to-face -face conversation with someone preparing your food, but it's really, really the best place to eat is at home, is at home. And you control everything you put in your mouth then. All right, so then gut health. Gut health is such a huge topic. And really when I got control of my gut health, it was life-changing for me. I was like, holy cow, like I don't have to be bloated every day. I don't have to look pregnant every day. I don't have to have icky gas and like all that stuff that I didn't, you know, I had those very classic symptoms, which is very frustrating, very frustrating. Um, and so I really want you to think about your gut health, start asking those right questions. Think about loading up your plate with those anti-inflammatory foods. Again, lots of fruits and vegetables, eating the rainbow. Um, don't eliminate food groups unless you know that they really do hurt you. Like most people can eat the full gamut of foods, you know, so you're already on this restrictive gluten-free diet because you have a gluten sensitivity or you have celiac disease. So you don't have to do everything. Like you can experiment and do, you know, if you want to try, like, you're like, oh, I know every time I eat oats, they bother me. Okay. Well, maybe try eliminating oats, right. And see how you feel, but know that the vast majority of people can eat oats and tolerate oats, right. With the gluten-free diet, gluten-free oats, I should say gluten-free. Okay, so, so just eat plenty of foods. You want to eat foods that are high in fiber, like those good whole grains. You want to eat lots of those vegetables and fruits. You know, nuts and seeds are going to give you such great sources of fat in your diet, like healthy fats, um, beans and fish and lean meats. These are all really good for you foods that, you know, have a well-rounded anti-inflammatory effect on your body. Um, don't feed the bad bacteria. So do you guys know this? I'm curious if you know, and if we were in a room together, be like, raise your hand if you know the food source for bacteria. So bacteria love sugar. That is their food source. So if you, if you crave sugar, if you crave sugar, that means you probably have some sort of gut dysbiosis. Like you have more bad bacteria in your gut and good bacteria. And those bacteria are super annoying and they are like in charge. They're like, go eat a donut now. Like I need sugar because if you don't feed them their food source, they're going to die. And, um, when I finally started to wake up to uh, my gut health and started to really take that serious, I, um, I went sugar-free for a whole month. I had, I had candida, obviously talk to your doctor, or you might have something different. I had candida and I just had this like bacteria and yeast build up in my stomach. And it was really upsetting to me. Like I had all those symptoms that I had wanted and hoped would go away with the gluten-free diet after I was diagnosed with celiac and they didn't fully go away and they reemerged at some point. And so I went sugar-free for a whole month and it was so hard because sugar is not only just the white stuff, but it's also in breads and it's also, you know, in pizza and it's in a lot of foods that we eat that we don't necessarily look like sugar. And so um, I did this because I wanted to starve that bad bacteria. And so if you have some of those symptoms that, um, that you had hoped to get rid of with the gluten-free diet. It could be that you have to be gluten-free and you have to still work on your gut health and get that bacteria in check in your gut. And I think most Americans, and I, I know that there's many studies about this, most Americans have gut issues. And it's because we eat diets that aren't um, feeding the right bacteria in our gut. We're eating, we're eating a lot of sugar and processed foods and that's really feeding that bad bacteria in our guts. Um, and then one thing that, oh, life-changing for me, obviously talk to your healthcare provider about this, but adding beneficial bacteria was like, like a light bulb in my head when I started to take a good dose of a probiotic pill, not, not in your food, but in probiotic pill, it was helping me so much. So I was like starving out the bad bacteria. I was repopulating my gut with the good bacteria and, oh, just my whole body health changed. So really think about 
probiotics and asking some questions and doing some research on the role of probiotics in your body and if it works for you as well. And um, I just say like, these were some of the tips that really helped me improve my gut health so much. And then this last thing I want to share with you, these are Again, these were all life-changing for me because I think about my own journey to heal my body and it was it was definitely a journey. <laughs> and I think a lot of you feel that way too. Um, but resting and restoring your digestive system. So we eat all the time and we don't really give our bodies a chance to rest and restore because we're constantly eating. And that means our digestive system is constantly working, right? So think about if you broke your leg, let's say. You don't go running, you don't even walk your dog, you barely use your leg. Maybe you use it to go to work or the bathroom or to get some food in the kitchen, you're gonna use your leg, that's it. Um, and you're gonna try to stay off it as much as possible because you want it to rest and restore. And then you know at some point you can walk again normal, right? If you give it that chance to rest and restore. And obviously you don't wanna go crazy on it because it does have um, a vulnerability now, right? It's been broken once before and you don't want to break it again. So you do have to be easy on it, but you don't have to like not walk. Okay. So I want you to apply that same principle to your digestive system and think about how hard you are making your digestive system work. You're maybe eating hard to digest foods. Maybe you're not chewing your food enough. Maybe you're eating every few hours or even every hour snacking, constantly snacking. Maybe you're eating big, huge meals, then you're snacking at night. Maybe, um, I know people who wake up in the middle of the night because they're hungry and they eat. And so you are not giving your body that chance to really, or your digestive system, that chance to rest and restore. And so some of the things I do, like I, I don't snack, I rarely snack. And especially during the day, you know, I just eat my meals and then I wait four or five hours before I eat my next meal. So I'm really letting my digestive system work that food that it's already eaten um, without making it work over time. Just grab a drink of water. Hold on one second. And then I also um, don't eat after seven. So I say kitchen's closed. I go put my pajamas on. Well, I wear my pajamas all day right now sometimes, but <laughs> in normal times, I put my pajamas on, I brush my teeth and I'm done eating for the night. And then I wake up, I walk my dog, I do my morning things and about 7.30, I'm ready to eat my breakfast. And so that's given my body a good 12 hours of resting and restoring, resting and digesting. And so I want you to really think about ways you can rest and restore your broken digestive system. If it's totally inflamed, don't make it keep working so hard. Um, a lot of people do intermittent fasting, far from an expert on that, but the, that's sort of what the whole process of not eating from seven to seven is, is a form of intermittent fasting. And so those are just some questions and thoughts for you to think about if this is, you know, if you're making your gut work overtime. <laughs> um, other ways to rest and restore, um, love green juicing, huge green juicing advocate, lots of vegetables. Let the blender or the juicer do that pre-digesting for you. You know, a lot of us don't realize digest, digestion, ugh, <laughs> digestion begins in the mouth. You know, the mechanical chewing is part of digestion. There's enzymes in your mouth, digestive enzymes that do some of the chemical digesting. It's a lot of work. And then it's, you know, got to go in your stomach acid. There's a lot of work in the digestive system to get that food absorbed. But when you actually do the chewing in, in your juicer or your blender, that's saving a huge process. That's really resting your, your digestive system in many ways. And it's breaking down the food in such tiny bits that it's so easily absorbed by your body. So just imagine like drinking this green juice and like your digestive system doesn't have to lift a finger and it's just being coated with all this goodness, all this goodness. And the same with bone broth. So those can be, some people really love bone broth. It's just such a soothing, a soothing way to get some really interesting vitamins and nutrients into your body quickly without having to really work your digestive system to the max. Okay. So those are some of my solutions to really getting the most out of your gluten-free diet and maybe going beyond gluten-free, um, you know, to really help yourself achieve whole body health. And like I said, we are on this gluten-free diet, might as well make the most of it, right? 
make the most of it, do great stuff. Okay, so now I um, want to get to the free gifts and giveaway section and this will go quickly and then I'm gonna hop on and check out some of the questions that I see coming in, which I can't wait to dive into. Um, so have some free bees and some giveaways to share. Okay, so your first freebie, I hope you guys can see this okay, um, is that I have a gut friendly meal plan for you. So this is a screenshot of the meal plan. When we hang up on this call, on this webinar, I'm gonna email this to you. Okay, so it'll be in your inbox. If you don't see it, check your spam. Be sure to whitelist my email, Jenny at goodfreeglutenfree.com um, or just send me an email and say, hey, I didn't get it and we'll figure out what's going on. But this is, um, I think a lot of you might know I, I make meal plans. I, I, have, I have over 1,700 recipes in my database and I create meal plans every week based on seasonal ingredients. And then I share these meal plans with my, I have a pretty large uh, community of people who um, get my meal plans every Friday emailed to their inbox, which is really fun. And they, these all come with recipes and everything. So I created this gut friendly meal plan for all of you. So give it a try, see if any of these recipes speak to you, but these are all recipes, low sugar, lots of good fruits and vegetables and easier to digest foods without eliminating any food group. You'll even notice some of them use some maple syrup and things like that. So I hope you enjoy this free meal plan. I really put a lot of thought into getting something yummy together for you and that has some seasonal ingredients as well. Okay, so the next free gift is I have a dollar off Crunchmaster coupon for all of you. Um, so these are the bags that you'll see at grocery stores. Um, you can get the multi-seed, which is their most popular as shown, or they have grain-free. This is made with cassava and or coconut flour, things like that. So something for everyone. I will email this link to you too. So in your email from me, You'll have the meal plan and you'll have this link where you can go get a dollar off coupon to Crunchmaster, which is awesome. Always good to save money. Okay, and then I have a giveaway. So five winners are gonna get a Crunchmaster prize package. So my friends at Crunchmaster are putting a bunch of different uh, flavors of their cracker, different varieties of their crackers and stuff in a big old box and they're gonna mail it to your doorstep. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to go to a store to get it. It's gonna come right to you, which is perfect in uh, this pandemic. And then this, the same winners. So it's a package. So you're gonna get the Crunchmaster prize package. You can get a copy of my new book, Dear Gluten, It's Not Me, It's You. I'm gonna send it from my home. So it will come straight to your doorstep separately as well. And then I'm also going to give you a quarterly meal plan subscription. So you, for the next three months, every Friday, you'll get a new, email, uh, a new meal plan email to you. So I'm excited to be able to give that away as well in our prize package. So just before we hopped on this call, I took the list of everyone who registered and I plugged it into this uh, online picker, like a raffle picker. And so they picked the five winners. So I have the five winners on the next slide. Okay, so these are the winners. These are the five winners. Um, totally random, hoping you're all, <laughs> um, hoping you're all here. And um, I will email each of you to grab your information so I know where to mail these fun gifts. But these are our winners. So if you see your name up there, you won that awesome prize package. Okay, so thank you so much for attending. Like I said, this whole book launch has been interesting during COVID. And so I'm really excited that I can bring this talk and this expo in a way to all of you. Please come find me online. If you're not following me, all my information's right here. And I'm gonna be back in January with uh, another webinar. And so wait, let me see if I can do this. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, I'm gonna launch this poll. Let's see. Okay, so it should have hopefully appeared on your screen. I want you to vote for two of the topics you like to see me cover in the future. And so um, I have several topics up there, decoding confusing food labels and products for hidden gluten, strategies for weight management when eating gluten-free, 
celiac disease versus gluten sensitivity versus food sensitivities versus allergies 101, just really understanding the differences and similarities between all of those disorders. Budget busting, little, way, little known ways to save money, score deal, deals and eat deliciously on the gluten-free diet. Um, eating out safely, how to avoid getting gluten when eating outside the home. You all know if you follow me <laughs> that I eat out and test my food for hidden gluten and stuff. So I know that's a big topic a lot of you enjoy. So please continue voting. I'll leave that up for a little bit while we talk here. And um, I'm gonna be back in January with another webinar, more fun giveaways. And I hope you'll join me then. So let me stop this screen share. Here we are. I should, hopefully I'm back on the screen now. I'll leave this poll up for a little bit because I'm loving seeing all your votes. Um, and that's gonna really help me uh, create a session for you. And like I said, there's no strings attached. This is a, a chance for us to talk and connect in this weird time and I love being able to share what I know and help all of you. So let's go into this q and I'm going to click on this Q&A and I see actually I see a ton of comments and I love seeing where you're all from here. So if you have a question go into the Q&A versus the chat because I'm going to go through those and then I will look at the chat in a bit. It's just so it's a lot at once for me to see. So um, I see a question here from Grace. Hello, I missed the ingredient in Rice Krispies that have gluten. I thought they were gluten-free. Gosh, I thought they were gluten-free too, Grace. This is why it's so frustrating to be gluten-free. Rice Krispies, Kellogg's Rice Krispies contains barley malt. They actually coat the Rice Krispies with barley malt. I guess it makes it crispier in, um, in milk, when you put your, you know, your cereal, you put it in a bowl and put milk in it, so it keeps it from getting too soggy. So they use barley malt, and it is not gluten free. But there are many crisp rice cereals out there that are gluten free. I think is it called thirty degrees or something, ninety nine degrees or something with degrees in it. <laughs> um, I know Barbara's makes it. There's a couple of brands out there that are completely gluten free, and you can still make your rice crispy treats with those. Okay. Okay, um, and it looks like a bunch of people answered, so I love that. And by the way, Kellogg's used to make a gluten-free Rice Krispie. It was in a yellow box. They don't, they discontinued it. So if you've ever seen people write about gluten-free Rice Krispies, that's why, but it's been discontinued. Okay, so let me just see here. I guess so not a question from Linda, but she talked about a restaurant in Minnesota. So if you're in Minnesota, check out what Linda had to say um, about uh, feeling safe while eating out. And there are some great restaurants where you can eat out. Um, oh, I guess I need to click this answer live button. I'm sorry, I'm a little new to using the Q&A feature here. So let's see. Okay, I was, um, Linda wrote, I was interested to learn that the Mayo testing showed that I have a gene for celiac, yet only 10% of people with the gene have celiac. Their diagnosis is that I am gluten intolerant, not celiac, which was a big relief to hear. I've been on a gluten-free diet for well over 12 years and sugar is a huge challenge. Oh, I hear you girl, <laughs> it's a huge challenge for me too. Um, okay, so there's no question there, but that is true that in order to have celiac disease, three things must be present. You must have the gene. I think there's very rare that people would not have the gene that would have celiac disease. So you have to have one of the two genes. You also have to be eating gluten. So if you're not eating gluten, you can't really have celiac in a way, like that's the trigger. Um, and you have to have some sort of intestinal permeability. And so that's where we see a lot of people with leaky gut. Um, and that's usually the, the straw that, 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 oh, I don't know the expression, but it's usually the last straw here. And that is what um, will then get you sort of thinking that you might have something wrong with you and you go talk to your doctor. So those three things must be present in order to have celiac. Um, a lot of people do have the gene. They may never go on to have celiac because they may not have that intestinal permeability. They may not have that episode that just turns on your genes. One thing that we're learning, it's super new, is that, um, oh, I'm gonna end the poll here. Sorry, if that's blocking your screen. Um, 
One thing that we're learning is that genes, you can have genes for a lot of potential disorders and never, it means you may never get them though. Like something has to happen. One thing that's really interesting about celiac disease is that it's the only autoimmune disease in the world where the trigger gluten is known. So that's why it's a really highly studied disease because we can learn a lot from celiac. It's the only, you know, only one we know the trigger for. So we can learn a lot about other diseases potentially from celiac. Kind of interesting. Um, I'm just looking at the questions to make sure I, see, I can answer them. So Jessica said, I recently looked into bone broths. There's so many options. How do I know which one to go for with the most benefits? So I actually don't buy my bone broth. I don't know the brands very well. I make my own. And all you have to do is take like Chicken bones, you can even go to Whole Foods and just ask for chicken bones where they, they have them, um, um, they have chicken bones frozen that you can just buy really cheap from like organic chickens. You wanna buy all the bones, the backbone, whatever you can buy and whatever you can find and put it in your own container, your own big pot with some vegetables, maybe a little apple cider vinegar and you just let it cook for 12, you know, simmer for 12, 24 hours. And you have your own bone broth, you just, you know, skim out everything up, drain, you know, drain it and you have what, what's drained you keep, obviously don't put it down your sink. <laughs> and um, that's your own bone broth. So I don't know a lot about bone broth brands. Um, some of them are a little harder for me personally to drink. I've, I've tried a few store-bought brands. They're, um, they're thick and, you know, you have to have a taste from this. why I kind of like my own chicken broth, but you can make your own broth with beef bones, chicken bones, and or fish bones. Those are all really good bone broth options. All right, Lisa said, I'm diabetic, so how can I manage best? I am diagnosed celiac. Okay, yes, yeah, so you have two things going on. You have celiac and you have diabetes. And so this goes back to what we were saying before that just because something's gluten-free doesn't mean it's good for you. And obviously um, sugar is a big issue. And, um, you know, I would consider, you know, have you talk to your doctor, obviously, but there are some great resources out there where you can make a lot of sugar-free, green-free, um, gluten-free foods for yourself. But I will tell you the best thing to do is just to make your own food and, and eat, 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 you know, whole real foods, foods that don't always have a label on them, right? Like avocados don't have a label on them, right? Um, and so I think just really watching your gut health, watching your sugar is going to really help you. But I would definitely talk to your doctor because I am far from a diabetes expert. Okay, um, I'm just going through your questions still too. Um, Nally said, I have celiac and eat gluten-free. I was wondering how do you deal with cross-contamination from restaurants? I fear when eating out, I could be accidentally gluten and not knowing it. Um, and I don't always get a noticeable reaction, which is always hard when you don't get a noticeable reaction. You don't know um, if you are eating gluten. Restaurants are definitely a beast. It's so hard. I'm not going to lie to you. It's not it's not, there's no magic bullet, but I think the most important thing you can do for restaurants is express that you are serious about eating gluten-free to order things that are as clean as possible. Like as tempting as it is to want to order gluten-free pizza. Like I know I miss pizza. I miss it a lot, but I also know that pizza in a restaurant is not cooked in a safe way for me. So if I want pizza, I make my own or I use like frozen pizzas at home. There's some really great brands out there that you can look into. I have on my blog, a whole list of all the frozen pizzas that I found and I tested them all for hidden gluten and I taste tested them. So um, if you're interested in pizza, but restaurants, you just have to be careful. You have to order strategically and you have to be really serious. And that could potentially be a future um, discussion that I would love to share with everyone in a webinar. So I um, hope that helps you. Um, Okay, so here, oh, we got a Cheerios question. <laughs> Cheerios from Andrea, they have gluten-free on the box, but it does not have certified gluten-free. So why is it a confusing, a confusing topic? Okay, so Cheerios, I is a, Cheerios is such a confusing um, product because you'll see a lot of people in the celiac community do not um, advocate for Cheerios. And there's been just a lot of discussions and it's, it's a, 
it's a very personal thing. And I, you know, honestly, no judgment. And I actually am neutral on Cheerios, to be honest with you. But you're correct. They do say that they're gluten free. So they do need the FDA guidelines of gluten free labeling. They are not certified gluten free, which would be that next level of having a third party verification, which they would have to pay for. Um, it's a third party verification. So the reason Cheerios uh, it, in a very basic way, the reason Cheerios are controversial is they contain oats. And this is such a big, big topic. It's, I don't even if I can, know if I can do it quickly, but there's two types of oats. Um, well, first of all, you should know oats are inherently gluten-free. However, they are highly contaminated during the harvesting. They're grown on the same fields as wheat. They um, are processed on the same equipment. And so really, if you eat just a bag of plain oats, chances are it has a lot of gluten in it, okay? So companies um, can use either purity protocol oats, which are oats grown on dedicated gluten-free fields and dedicated gluten-free equipment, or they can use what's called commodity oats. And commodity oats are those oats that are grown on wheat fields and they are then either mechanically or optically sorted and scrubbed of gluten and they are gluten-free. And many major companies use um, commodity oats because it's very hard to find enough purity oats for someone like Quaker. It's, it's really hard for them to find enough purity protocol oats for their gluten-free oat products, right? So they're using this, these commodity oats that they're sorting and scrubbing of gluten and um, and then they're testing and they're doing a lot of testing of those oats and Bob's Red Mill too, they're using those commodity oats and they're testing and they're, the way they're testing is satisfactory to a lot of people in the gluten-free community. So what we're seeing with Cheerios is that they are using those commodity oats where they're sorting either, I don't know if they're mechanically or optically sorting them and then they're scrubbing them of the oat, of the, of the wheat so that they are gluten-free but their testing hasn't been um, acceptable to some people in the gluten-free community and therein lies the problem. So regardless if you're using purity protocol oats or you're using commodity oats, you have to have satisfactory testing and batch testing so that we can trust and know that these products are gluten-free. And so a lot of people have a little bit of a beef with Cheerios about that, about the way they're testing it. And if they're really testing it in a way that is satisfactory for people who cannot eat or tolerate oats. Okay, so that's the whole Cheerios in a nutshell. Happy to chat with you more about it. Um, I'm so sorry, I forgot where I was here. Okay, Priscilla said, how can I tell if medications and vitamins have gluten? Great question. So a lot of, um, a lot of vitamins are actually labeled, which is really nice. And you can usually find a vitamin for pretty much anything that has a gluten-free label, but you still have to be so, so careful. Um, there's a pill, pillbox.com. Actually, I'm not sure the, the URL, but pillbox.com, it's, it's part of the National Health Institute website. You can put in different medications in their system and search for gluten and, and ingredients. Um, there's actually a lot of advocacy happening in the medical um, or in the gluten-free community to have these companies be more transparent in what they're putting in their medications, particularly in the inactive ingredients. The active ingredients, we um, they're pretty clear about what the active ingredients, it's those inactive ingredients that we don't know. And a lot of them are using that like innocuous starch kind of thing. They're just saying, oh, it's got starch in it. Well, what well, kind of starch, right? And so a lot of these, um, I write about this in my book, my frustration with, <laughs> with one company, huge, huge pharmaceutical company, chances are you have this medication in your, in your medicine cabinet and they just can't answer me if there's gluten in it or not. And it's so frustrating. Like, I don't, I don't know why they can't even like this huge multi-billion dollar international pharmaceutical company can't tell me if there's gluten in their product and it doesn't make sense to me. And so there's actually a lot of advocacy going on. Um, beauty products have a list of, if you go and look at um, on my blog at cosmetics and stuff, it'll there's a list of ingredients to watch out for, particularly oats. You'll see oats in a lot of cosmetic lotions and things like that. So you want to like Aveeno products have a lot of oats in them. So you want to watch out for that. Um, different lip balms have oats in it. I think I, I had, my daughter had lip smackers and I noticed it had wheat 
wheat syrup in it or something like that, or vitamin E that says wheat, it said wheat in it somehow. So you definitely want to read labels, check with manufacturers. Um, they are starting to label more, but it's, it's not a great system to be honest with you. Oh, and let's see. Okay, we go to the next question. Oh, I think I did this one. I am so sorry. These are not easy to read here. Um, okay. Okay, so Susan said, what are your thoughts about a label that doesn't specifically say gluten-free like tomato sauce, but the ingredients are obviously gluten-free. Okay, so we definitely need to do this gluten-free labeling decoding session. So <laughs> you guys have a lot of questions there. These are topics that I definitely cover, but um, you have to check with the manufacturer. You do. Um, a lot of times um, they may not give you an answer. If there is no gluten ingredients in it, um, you can try it. Um, but, um, you know, it is always nice when they do make that disclosure. So I just ask the company and, you know, if the brand is something that they're, they're being wishy-washy about it, I'll just find another brand. Um, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy for me to give you an example, you know, a, a, an answer without seeing that product, maybe following up with the manufacturer and really decoding some of the ingredients in there and making sure I understand what all those ingredients are. Because we know most marineras do not just have tomatoes in them, like they're going to have all sorts of stuff in them. So, okay. Oh, please repeat the title of your book and the autoimmune book. Okay, so my book is called Dear Gluten, It's Not Me, It's You. And you can look for that on Amazon and, um, and find it there. And um, the doctor who wrote the foreword to my book is Dr. Tom O'Brien, and he wrote The Autoimmune Fix. That is the book, that is like my Bible. I love that book so much and that's, um, why I reached out to Dr. Tom and said to him that I really um, want him to write the forward to my book. He's just changed my life and my thinking about gluten sensitivity. And I'm going to be live on Dr. Tom's Facebook page, I think on December 8th, I'll post about it. Um, so I'm gonna have a discussion with him on his Facebook page then, which I'm really excited about. Okay. Um, how do you know if medications, okay, we already answered the medications. Um, Jessica said, I have several family members that are gluten-free for health reasons like celiac and endometriosis. I've been trying to eat and convert all gluten-free by choice. I'm 30 and never even had the label of gluten on anything until they really started labeling everything in the store. What do you think about having my children be gluten-free as well? They are 12, 6, 5, and 4, no health issues, but I know what gluten can do and don't want them having stomach issues in the future. All right, Jessica, so I'm so glad you... Um, wrote this because I think a lot of people need to hear this. Um, the most important thing you can do is not to go gluten-free until you get tested. It's actually dangerous. Like you really want to rule out celiac disease. So if you suspect, if you have family members that have celiac, first of all, you have a higher chance of having celiac. It's in your first degree relatives. I forget, it's a higher chance with first degree relatives but there's still a higher, a high chance if it's a second degree relative, like a cousin. So you definitely all want to get tested for celiac. You can talk to your doctor about testing. There's a great at home test. Um, if you email me, I, I think I have, I have a coupon for it or something, but there's an at home test where you can all do a blood test at home and just um, make sure you rule out celiac. You can also go through testing for gluten sensitivity. Again, work with an integrative nutrition a nutritionist or a holistic um, functional nutritionist, they can run some of these really great tests that we have today to test for gluten sensitivity. You just want to know, you want to be able to know that you have or don't have celiac disease. It's so important for so many reasons, which is a whole other discussion I could go on and on about, but make sure you do that. So don't take your kids off gluten until you get tested. Then once you get tested and let's say negative for celiac, negative for gluten sensitivity, but you still see and think your kids are hurting because of gluten, then you can try eliminating it and see if things, the symptoms, the behavior issues, whatever it is, like people do gluten-free for many reasons, you can try it for those. But first, please get tested. It's so important. Um, like I said before, those who have celiac disease are way more compliant with the gluten-free diet. They're less likely to cheat. They're less likely to be like, oh, a little bite won't hurt me. 
Um, so it's so important. And then if there's ever treatment options beyond the gluten-free diet, you wanna qualify for them. And in order to get tested for celiac or gluten sensitivity, you must be eating gluten. So if you're gluten-free, it's very hard to get tested for celiac. A lot of times you have to be eating gluten. You have to go back on gluten, which can be so painful for so many people just to get a diagnosis of something that you know you don't want to eat anyway. So just do it before. Do all the testing before you go gluten-free. Oh, I did that already. Okay. Um, are there prescription medications that contain gluten? Again, go to that pillbox.com or I may not have the URL right, but it's through the National Health Institute um, and you can look. And I think some people put some other labels up there and always contact the manufacturer. And even if you get that, that wishy-washy answer from a manufacturer like, well, we don't put gluten in it, but we can't guarantee it's gluten-free. Like you'll get that answer a lot. At least you're asking because these companies are tracking those frequently asked questions. And the more we keep asking and nagging them, the more they're going to start taking this serious. And like I said, there's some um, legislation that, that is being advocated for to have uh, labeling, you can, you can Google it, the FDA, they're working, or not the FDA, I forget who it is, but they're working towards having labeling on medications and, and, and on those inactive ingredients and, and disclosing allergens on those, not just gluten, but other allergens as well. Um, please repost the slide with other areas of the body that are impacted by celiac. Oh, well, I don't need a slide, Linda, because it's every cell in your body can be impacted by gluten if you have a gluten sensitivity or celiac disease. So it's, it can be any, you can have migraines, you can have joint pain, you can have skin disorders like psoriasis or something. You can have all sorts of issues, um, other autoimmune diseases that are all can be tied to gluten if you have a sensitivity or celiac. So get tested, make sure you get tested, Linda, if you haven't already, okay? I think you said you might be celiac. But, um, okay, so Bethany, well, let me try to, if your blood work and GI map stool test come back positive for celiac, is it necessary to get a biopsy to confirm? It seems counterintuitive to have to start eating damaging gluten in order to get tested. If your blood work is positive, those tests are very, very accurate. Obviously, you want to talk to your doctor about the right diagnosis or the right um, testing for you. In the US, the gold standard diagnosis is to have an endoscopy biopsy of your small intestine to confirm the blood test, the positive results. Um, if you have already gone off gluten and you do have a confirmed celiac blood test, talk to your doctor. You may not need to get that. So like, that's really a discussion for you to have with your doctor about the best course. Um, I did have the blood test, which was positive, And then I had a biopsy to confirm it, right? And that is the gold standard. But I think we're seeing other countries or maybe just going off the blood test, things like that. So again, talk to your doctor. This is like a very um, personal thing that you guys have to talk about um, to confirm this diagnosis. But if you have a blood test, you have celiac. It's, it's very um, accurate for positives. There's a lot of false negatives, but it's very accurate when pos positive. Okay, Christina, I've heard people say that just because it's certified gluten-free doesn't mean it's celiac safe. Is there any truth to that? Um, Certified gluten-free just means that a third party has verified that gluten-free claim. And I know that the GFCO, the Gluten-Free Certifying Organization, they're the largest certifying agency. They're the ones with the GF in the circle, although they're changing, actually, here I can show you. I can show you. They're this one. Can you guys see that? It's on the package, the GF circle. They're changing their logo, but um, I think they test for 10 parts per million of gluten, which is, um, lower, like so the FDA says it has to contain less than 20 parts per million, but in order to be certified gluten-free by the GFCO, it has to be less than 10 parts per million per gluten. So it may have a speck of gluten in it, but I will say certified gluten-free is, I would say it's pretty foolproof, like it's a safe product for you to consume. If you eat it and have a reaction, you need to report it and need to investigate further. But um, certified gluten-free is a much, um, more trusted claim to me than just gluten-free. Again, we can talk about that in our um, next session. I guess we're going to do the labeling session soon. <laughs> All right, Mary said, after I'm already bloated and didn't eat gluten, but this, wait, 
uh, after I'm already bloating, bloated, didn't eat gluten, but this bloat, what can I do to get rid of the bloat? Okay, so we're basically talking what to do to get rid of the bloat. So really my, my thought is to start asking the right questions. Why are you bloated? Is it not just gluten? Is it something else that you're eating? Do you have a gut dysbiosis? Is there something more going on? I mean, bloating can be caused by a lot of things. So you need to be a detective and find out, is it another food you're eating that's causing it? Is your gut health need some work? Does your gut health need some work? Um, you know, things like Pepto-Bismol and antacids, you know, antacids are actually a little counterintuitive and, and, and talk to your doctor about this, but you know, when you're quelling the production of acid in your stomach, you're actually doing a little harm. Think about it, doing harm to your digestive system because when you eat something, you want your stomach acid to really break it down. You want it to bubble up and work um, this way that these large food particles are not getting into your small intestine. And so if you are quelling the acid in your stomach, you're letting these undigested particles of food get into your small intestine. And when they get in their, the small intestine, they don't know what to do. And then they're gonna break out of the wall and create holes in the, the paper thin lining of your small intestine and go into your bloodstream. So don't throw like gasoline on the fire, like really look at your gut health and talk to your doctor about ways you can improve it. That's gonna help you. That really is gonna help you. Okay. Diana said, do carbs turn into sugar causing bacteria? Well, I wouldn't say carbs as a thing, but I will say certain foods like, like bread and grains do convert to sugar in your body. And I think in, um, in Wheat Belly, the book, it talks a lot about how wheat has a higher I'm sorry, a piece of wheat bread has a higher glycemic index um, or has one of the highest glycemic indexes. So, so it's almost like eating sugar. So, you know, carbs can come in many different categories. You know, even an apple has carbs, but when you eat an apple, it also has nutrients in it, right? And it has fiber and it has all the things you need to kind of digest that sugar and everything. Um, and so, but when you eat just a plain piece of bread or rice or whatever, it can convert to sugar in your body and, and will feed that bad bacteria. I hope that answers your question. I don't know, I'm not like an expert expert on this, but <laughs> I know enough to be dangerous. All right, Judy said, after you are diagnosed with celiac, how often should you be tested? Great question. I don't know that there is a, a like a firm answer on this, but a lot of people, um, we'll recommend monitoring every, uh, for, after first being diagnosed, you want to get monitored by your doctor after six months and then a year and then year, uh, like every year after that, potentially. Um, I don't know that you need to do the endoscopy biopsy unless you are still having issues. So let's say you're still having gut issues several years into this. Your doctor may want to do another biopsy to see what's going on, but a blood test can help you monitor the effectiveness of your gluten-free diet. And are you really getting the gluten out? And a lot of people who go gluten-free and are still feeling sick, and then they take that celiac to test a year or two later, and it's still positive for celiac, that means they're still eating gluten because their body's making antibodies to gluten. So it really can help you if you continue to test every year to make sure you're staying on track. And I don't always test every year, but I feel fine. But if I, I know a lot of people who don't feel fine. And so they want to get monitored and tested and, 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 and really try to figure it out a lot. It's really eye-opening for a lot of people when they do test positive for celiac two years later, um, that means they're still eating gluten. They're still not compliant with the diet. Okay, we are running out of time, but I'm going to stay on if anyone wants to continue to stay on, because I know you guys have a lot of questions. Would, would I need to follow the same principles for hyperthyroidism? Um, thyroid, like uh, autoimmune Hashimoto's thyroid disease is definitely, a, a lot of people with celiac disease have Hashimoto's and, and or gluten sensitivity and vice versa. So um, I would definitely talk to your doctor about that. And there's some great books, I think. Dr. Isabella Wentz wrote, is it the Hashimoto's Protocol? I read it a while ago. Um, it's a great book um, with very similar principles to, to healthy eating and getting your gut check and your hormones balanced and all that stuff. So um, that's a good book for you to potentially check out about hyperthyroidism. 
Okay, Debbie said, what is your thought on supplements such as Boost if you're not able to prepare your own shakes? Oh, I don't, I don't think I know what Boost is. Um, I don't, I, I don't know the answer to this, to be honest. Um, but I will say with supplements, like especially like with probiotics, I I think it's best to take it in a pill form. It's going to be the most effective. Um, a lot of yogurts will say they are probiotic, but they also have a ton of sugar. So here's what you're doing. You're eating the yogurt that has sugar in it. So you're putting the beneficial bacteria in, but then you're eating the sugar that's also feeding the bad bacteria. So you're kind of at square one or maybe worse off. So um, I don't do a lot of supplements like shakes or things like that. Um, I think if you do want to do any supplements, you can talk to your doctor. There are several supplements that a lot of people with celiac disease take um, more in a pill form, but I don't, I don't have anything to add on the boost. I'm so sorry. I can't answer that question. Um, I'm going to, what is, what is your opinion of getting acupuncture for celiac disease? You know, I've heard of people trying different alternative therapies. My opinion is you are your best scientist. You are your own detective. So try, try things, see what works for you because what works for you may not work for me. And there's, you know, no judgment in anything. So I don't have an opinion necessarily, but I think it's so important for people to try different things because we are all unique bio individuals and different things work for different people. And my poison could be your ticket to good health, right? So <laughs> you, you need to do what's good for you. So give it a try. Um, all right, so someone just asked about spices and how do you buy spices and herbs to ensure they're truly gluten-free? That's a very good question. I have a whole article on my blog about spice brands, which are gluten-free, which are certified gluten-free. And I've even tested some of them myself for hidden gluten. Um, there's many brands that are certified gluten-free that um, I think Morton and Bassett, and those are, I find those at most grocery stores like Kroger's and Safeways um, are certified gluten-free by the NSF. Um, Spicely is another brand that's certified gluten-free. They are a little more money, but um, that peace of mind is worth it to me. So um, there's other brands that just have no gluten claims. I've done all the research for you in this article. So go check it out on my website and just send me an email if you can't find it and I'll, I'll send it to you. Okay, thank you. Oh, these are so sweet. Brown rice, rice krispies still have gluten. Um, what do you recommend for a child who is underweight due to due to years of misdiagnosis? He's 17, 5'5 five, five and weighs 90 pounds. He needs to grow. Right. So I, I don't know if he has celiac. If he has celiac, a lot of times that you will find that failure to thrive or that delayed growth. Um, I, I know that's okay. So Aaron just said, yes, if he does have celiac. So I think again, we're all unique individuals and we just, we are who we are. And, um, you know, he may have his growth spurt now. I think boys continue to grow. I also have a son who is on the smaller end too. I've ruled out celiac. He doesn't even have the celiac gene, <laughs> but, um, you know, I've just been told people just grow at different rates. So I would talk to your doctor and a, a pediatric endocrinologist or something like that. I hope that helps. Okay. Uh, Andrea said, I have read that celiac causes, I think she meant to say ir irreversible damage in the gut. Are you saying in the presentation that you can heal the damage? Well, if you saw that study, that people can, 60, I think it was 66% of people with celiac disease, disease have that full mucosal recovery, that lining of their small intestine is recovered in five years. So it is not irreversible. It's actually, it actually can be healed. And, you know, when you look at someone who is on a gluten-free diet and very compliant and healthy, and if you look at their small intestine in a biopsy, you're going to see those microvilli are going to be healthy and flowing again. So yeah, it's, it can be restored. Um, the thing is, once you have celiac, you always have it. So right now I imagine my, <laughs> my microvilli are floating around being happy and, 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 and healthy right now. But if I were to go back to eating gluten, I would just damage them again and they would you know, become stubs or flattened again, right? So you have to stay. This is like a lifelong um, 
a lifelong treatment, gluten-free diet. So yeah, it's not irreversible. And actually, don't quote me on this, but I believe that the lining of your small intestine is it's just like your skin. It, it, it replaces every seven to 14 days if given the chance. So it's actually a very um, restoring organ. And then she said, what are the names of professionals who can test for non-celiac gluten sensitivity? Yeah, so this again, like I said, non-celiac gluten sensitivity is such a new disorder that a lot of the testing is still fledging. The, the research isn't quite there yet. Um, there's some tests out there. Um, you can work with your practitioner or find an integrative uh, nutrition professional to help you get the tests that you need if you can't find them online. Um, there's a test for gluten sensitivity by Cyrex, C-Y-R-E-X. I think it's called the Cyrex Array 4. That is a pretty comprehensive gluten sensitivity test. And I believe you need to work with a doctor to get that test. There's also a wheat zoomer test that Dr. Tom talks about a lot. Um, so you can look up wheat zoomer. And uh, again, you need to work with someone to get those tests and uh, those can help you get tested for gluten sensitivity. I don't know a ton about it because there's just not a lot of information out it. And it's still, it's still, it's still becoming a disorder, right? Like it's still something we're researching and understanding, right? And just because your tests come back negative for celiac and gluten sensitivity doesn't mean gluten makes you feel great. Like if it still makes you feel bad, don't eat it, right? No judgment, right? If, don't eat what makes you feel sick. Okay, so I think that, okay, uh, there's so many questions. Hey, I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes. If you need to go, hop off any time. Um, but I do wanna to try to answer your questions. Okay, Erica, do you pay attention to allergy statements made in a facility or on shared equipment with wheat? Okay, those, <laughs> that's a big question. I definitely am gonna do my gluten-free labeling um, talk next because that is a, is a long discussion. So I will, to be continued, I will be answering that question in a future webinar. So please, please tune in. Okay. Um, Ruth said there have been articles lately in health reports that show probiotics have not been proven effective. Can you comment on this? Hey, you can find a study that proves anything I feel like. Try it. Talk to your doctor about trying it yourself and see, okay? It's life-changing for me. So, hey, someone can say it's not effective. Someone can say gluten sensitivity is not real. It's real if it's happening to you and it's working for you. So that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> um, Tammy said, I've been using your meal plan and have been reading your book. Thank you, Tammy. I love you. Thank you. We are loving the meal plan and your book is very informative. Thank you for all you do um, to make this difficult diagnosis easier to handle and understand. Oh, thank you. Well, that wasn't a question, but I'm glad I said it. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. Um, Amber said, I was diagnosed with celiac disease just a year ago and I'm still losing my hair. Oh, I'm so sorry, Amber. Okay, I do have some thoughts for you. Talk to your primary care doctor, 100%. Hair loss can be associated not just with, it can be associated more with like thyroid and hormone issues. Um, I, I, well, I'm gonna share something really personal with all of you. Okay, so I had been on the birth control pill for, forever for a long, long time, like most women. And I decided that it was making me sick. I'm going off this, whatever. I'm, I just can't handle this anymore. And when I went off birth control, it was about a year process where my hair was falling out. Um, I had like really bad skin and acne and, and I was an adult. This was, we're talking just a few years ago and it was very embarrassing and very hard. You know, I've always been used to having this lovely thick hair. And so um, I did get tested. My thyroid was fine, but what my doctor was telling me was that I was probably going through um, some sort of post birth control syndrome. And I read about that. There's a great book called Beyond the Pill by Dr. Jolene Brighton, and she talks all about getting your hormones balanced because that is, is probably a potential thing for you to look into is your hormones and your thyroid. So talk to your doctor, get those tests get those tests if your hair is falling out because that is not normal and you want to get to the bottom of it. And 
just sharing that I went through something similar. I'm not saying that's what's happening to you, but I went through something similar and I hope that helps you maybe start asking the right questions of your doctor as well. And I can see a lot of people have said the same thing, thyroid, thyroid. So check your thyroid, get your hormone levels checked and, and um, do some research. I love Amber that you're asking the right questions though. Okay, Linda said, I, I am okay with Cheerios until I tried chocolate Cheerios, thinking they would be a good replacement for ice cream cones. They are marked. Okay, so I don't know. Actually, I know some Cheerios are not gluten-free, so check labels, but I don't, I don't know the answer to that. All right. Um, Catherine said, pots and pans, can they be a factor in cross-contamination? So... I, you should wash your pots and pans really well. Um, it can be a factor in cross-contamination. Um, so, it, it, you know, even your sponge can be a factor of cross-contamination. I remember before my house went fully, excuse me, before my house went fully gluten-free, we had a pink sponge for me and a blue sponge for gluten stuff. So when we were washing pots that had gluten in it, we were using the blue sponge. And when we were washing pots that had gluten free in it, we we're using the pink sponge. So it can, it can absolutely. I don't think you need to change everything. Like, you know, when you go to a restaurant or I go to my mom's house, it's not gluten free and I still eat off the silverware and the plates and the pots, right? So um, it's just, it's sort of a personal decision and, and, and knowing that someone has washed the pots to make you a meal. But you do wanna be careful. I mean, there's certain things you wanna be careful of like colanders and toasters and things like that. Okay, I'm gonna skip down here. So Judy, what can we do to help get barley listed as the number one, as one of the allergens on labels, <laughs> right? So Judy, again, we need to do this gluten-free labeling class because <laughs> um, you guys have some great questions, but um, there are eight, allergens that manufacturers must disclose on packaging. And gluten is not technically an allergen, but wheat is. So wheat is, is listed as an allergen as one of the top eight. It's like eggs and peanuts and soy and things like that. And um, so product can say it's wheat free or not have a disclosure that it contains wheat, but it might have barley, which is also gluten. Um, so you can do some of your own advocacy to have, I, I would say more gluten because barley, and we aren't the only sources of gluten. There's many other sources of gluten as well. Um, and so I think you just need to do some advocacy and write the FDA and start start a petition. Um, I believe, I just, oh, I just got an alert about it that they're gonna add sesame as one of those allergens coming up. So, so obviously there's people who are advocating for more and more disclosures. I'm gonna just um, skip some of these. Okay, Lisa said, can you name the DNA test you had for your son? I have it, but I haven't sent it back yet. Okay, so I did the DNA test through the pediatrician. I just ordered it there. I was nervous to do um, an at-home test and have his, his DNA in the database, but um, I think there are at-home tests you can take and you can talk to your pediatrician. But I, it was actually really nice because like I said, my son is on the smaller side. And so I had always suspected celiac, but the test kept coming back negative. And I kept putting him through all these blood tests because I was like, oh, you have to have celiac. If I have celiac, you have celiac, you have some of the symptoms. And um, what we found is he didn't have the gene. He didn't have the gene for celiac. So um, not everything is, is celiac, right? And so it was, a, it was an interesting learning for me. but. Hopefully you can get that test, talk to your pediatrician, talk to your doctor. Um, I think I had to pay out of pocket for it, just so you know. Um, Vanina said, do you have to do an endoscopy again to check the healing of the intestinal walls? Again, this is a decision you will make with your doctor. If you are healing and progressing fine and feeling great, I don't think any doctor's gonna put you through an endoscopy again. Like it's just not worth it. But if you are struggling and you're not feeling 100%, your doctor may say, let's, let's see what's going on. Let's do another endoscopy. So again, it's a decision that you will make with your doctor and get a second opinion if you need to as well. Talk to your doctor. Guys, hopefully you see a theme here. Talk to your doctor. Best apps for newly diagnosed gluten-sensitive pe people. Um, 
I don't know. There's the, the Find Me Gluten-Free app, which I do like. But remember, people eat gluten-free at different levels. There's people who are not as serious. Um, and so read reviews on these apps carefully. Um, but that would be one app. Um, I see other people are giving you other apps. I was going to even see like these gluten-free scanners. I mean, they can't know for sure. And I'm going to tell you, ingredients change so fast. So one of my friends messaged me the hot dogs by Life. Oh my gosh, Life something. Uh, forgot the name of the brand, but it's a vegan hot dog that they get. And she always bought them and then she bought the smaller versions. She had the big ones and the smaller one. And then she noticed when she turned over the package, um, it had gluten in the smaller ones, but not gluten in the bigger ones. And so I reached out to the company last week and I just said, how come your big ones are fine and the little ones have wheat gluten in it? And they said, oh, we're switching all of ours to contain wheat gluten. So you just got one of the old ones and a new one. And so like, I can't trust any of these apps to be honest, the most, Accurate information will always be on the package, always be in the restaurant. So you can read a review, like you can go on my site and read about what's gluten-free at Panera, right? But really the most accurate information is that conversation you're gonna have with someone who's actually preparing the meal in the restaurant. Hope that helps. Okay. Um, someone just asked me about Dr. Peter Green. Yeah, he is a, a leading celiac doctor. He's great he has a book as well um, and I, surely read his studies, but I can't think of like off the top of my head, but yes, he's a great doctor. You can definitely trust what he has to say. Um, best places to shop, to bridge until like I cook more at home or best brands. Okay. So oh, grocery stores are amazing. Like there's so many gluten-free products out there. And I even noticed like Walmart just came out with a whole line of gluten-free products from their great value brands. So, which is really nice if you're eating gluten-free on a budget, but yeah, all the grocery stores are, are carrying gluten-free products. I mean, your best and most comprehensive places will be things like Whole Foods and Sprouts and a natural grocery store if you have one near you. Um, but I have noticed Kroger's and Safeways and Costco and Walmart and Target have been carrying gluten-free products. And like I said, if you want to really eat healthy, just eat the foods that don't have labels, eggs and avocados, and eat lots of those fruits and vegetables. They will always be gluten-free. And I know sometimes when I'm traveling and I want a snack and I, you know, just go grab an apple or sometimes I grab an avocado and I sit there and eat it with a spoon. Like it's just a great way to have a gluten-free snack that's good for you and not worry about labels. And I just lost where I was, I'm so sorry. Okay. Oh yeah, um, somebody said Aldi and Trader Joe's, they also have lots of gluten-free label product, but make sure you do look for things that are labeled there. Um, okay, so shampoo. Okay, yeah, so so if, you're, if your child's having a reaction to shampoo, it could be an allergy, which is different than celiac, which is a different reaction than gluten sensitivity. So you might have an allergy, you may wanna get your child allergy tested. Um, he could be allergic to wheat in addition to um, something else. So a wheat allergy affects a smaller amount of people, but it's a definitely a real disorder. Um, is there a link between cancer and celiac? Oh, these are such big, deep questions, you guys. I definitely think you should read some of the books that we've talked about here and talk to your doctor. But yes, you are at a higher risk if you are not managing your disorder, regardless of what it is properly. Um, so I'm gonna leave that, that one a little bit untouched here. Okay, what are your thoughts about glyphosate, Roundup, and gluten sensitivity or celiac? Okay, so remember we talked about how we wanna rest our digestive system and go easy on it. So when we do eat some of these chemical foods, it, we, we don't quite know. I mean, there's not a lot of studies on this, unfortunately, but if a crop has been sprayed with glyphosate, which is marketed um, as the brown Roundup, um, it's basically killing, it, it's, it's a, a weed killing, bug killing chemical. So it preserves the crops. So the apple stays intact, but the bugs and the weeds that might try to attack it do not. Um, so yeah, like I think that there's a fine line, like it definitely can affect some people. Um, 
there's just not a lot of research. I would direct you to the non-GMO project website for some great information. And also the environmental working group, the EWG, I think it's ewg.org. They have a list of the top foods that have the most chemical residue on it, the, the top produce. And those are ones that I typically tell people to buy organic. So those are the ones like, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think usually like raspberries and things like that, strawberries top the list of the most chemical residue when tested. And that's why I usually buy most of my berries gluten-free, I'm sorry, organic. So you sing gluten free. Um, they also have a, I think they call it the dirty dozen list, uh, the EWG. And then also at EWG.org, they have the clean 15, which are the crops that have the least chemical residue, that the least of that glyphosate. And so that's another great, th those are products like usually like avocados and bananas, and you know, they have a big thick peel on them. Um, those are products that I don't, I don't usually buy organic. I save myself some money, but I'll buy the products on the dirty dozen list organic. Okay. All right, Tammy said, you heard any update or changes regarding the NEMA tester? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do one more question after this and then I have to go, you guys. <laughs> um, so NEMA sensor article on my website, <laughs> there was issues with the NEMA sensor. I don't know, right now we were told they're out of business and then all of a sudden capsules were for sale again on um, Amazon, but NEMA is a gluten detecting device, a portable gluten detecting device, and I have used it a lot. A lot of you've seen me use it, um, but there's an update on my website. Just uh, search NEMA sensor or NEMA out of business, and you can get that full update, Tammy. So I'm going to just skip down one more question here to Denise, and this is my last question. I know you guys have so much stuff here, but I, I can't keep going because I'm way over our time and I've kept some of you long long enough here. But um, Denise just said, can a gluten sensitivity be healed or it is a lifelong condition? That is a great question. And Dr. Tom is a great source for you to, to read for answers to that. Because again, remember I said, gluten sensitivity is like a decade old disorder. It's pretty new and there's not a lot of information on it. We are seeing that a lot of people can be, um, can overcome some food sensitivities. That's like a whole other discussion. But uh, a lot of the research is showing that gluten sensitivity is a lifelong condition and that your body makes memory cells to it and memory B cells. And like it, like once you eat that gluten, your body's like, oh, attack, attack. I know that. I know I don't like that stuff. And so um, this is a really interesting topic. I don't have a ton of authority to answer that question, but I will say I do defer to Dr. Tom and he does say gluten sensitivity is a lifelong condition, just like celiac disease. Not all food sensitivities are. A lot of food sensitivities are just a sign of a leaky gut, but uh, gluten sensitivity can be more serious. So I would definitely do some more research. Great question. You're asking the right question. Okay, guys. So I have stayed on a um, half hour longer than I thought I would, but I really, really enjoyed chatting with you and answering your questions. So we will be back in January. I was just looking at the poll here. Definitely going to do this confusing labels presentation. So please come back for that. I will post information about that soon. And Crunchmaster, thank you so much. Crunchmaster is going to be sponsoring all three of these webinars and they are amazing companies. So go grab some crackers and some guacamole and join me again in January and February for um, our next sessions, which I am going to be working on right now. Thank you guys so much. A replay of this will be sent to your inbox along with your free gifts. And I will see you next time. If I didn't get to your question, you can email me. I'm available. All right. Take care. Bye.